Y'all excited? Yes. Y'all ready for this presentation? Yes. Let me do a, a quick little introduction of our uh, Baba Renoko Rashidi. Um, he's an anthropologist and historian with a major focus on what he calls the global African presence. That is, Africans outside of Africa before and after enslavement. He is the author or editor of 18 books. Y'all heard that? Y'all have all of them? 18 books. <laughs> the most recent of which are Black Star, The African Presence in Early Europe, published by Books of Africa in London in November 2011, and Africa Star Over Asia, The Black Presence in the East, published by Books of Africa in London in November 2012, and revised and reprinted in April 2013. His other works include The African Presence in Early Asia, co-edited by Dr. Ivan Van Sertema. Four of his works have been published in French. His two major forthcoming works are Uncovering the African Past, the Ivan Van Sertema Papers, and Everywhere We Are, the Global African Presence by Renoko Rashidi. Put your hands together for our Baba. for inviting me back. I'm having a wonderful time. I arrived um, yesterday afternoon and this morning did a, a tour of the Oriental Institute. And now what I want to do is I want to give you, uh, I want to do two presentations. I think I have enough time, instead of one long one, to do two fairly short ones. And they're both very new. So I hope you will enjoy it. I hope it resonates with you. Uh, I'm 60. Is there anybody older than 60 here? I'm the oldest one in the room. Uh, I have your permission to start. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. So um, the first presentation is a relatively new one. And up until uh, last week, I'd only done it once or twice. I lived in Toronto, in Canada, or near Toronto, for about a year. And uh, while I was there, I made a connection with a bookstore, which is the oldest black bookstore in Canada. It's called a different book list. It's very nice, a little bitty bookstore. A lot of books from the Caribbean, because the owners are from there. In Canada, a lot of the Africans who are there, when I say Africans, I mean all black people, um, they're from the Caribbean now. You have basically three or four different groups. You have one group of black folk who've been there for a long time in Canada, and they live, can everybody see me? No. Oh, man, I was afraid you were going to say that. <laughs> wow, that's a bummer. Smith. Thank you for spoiling that. <laughs> uh, yeah, one group of black folk, and they've been there for, how's that? Do I need to go in front? Yes. Oh, man, you guys are demanding crap. <laughs> <laughs> I'm liking you there for a moment. And then. <laughs> now, what if I sit down? You going to be mad? No. I can sit here? Yes. This is just the introduction now. Now, when it I asked to do the presentation. I'm going to go right back where I was and more than likely take my shoes off. All right, Canada, Africans in North America. You have black folk who came there. Of course, the French introduced a few enslaved Africans, but smaller number. Canada doesn't have the kind of climate where you would need a large enslaved population to work on cotton fields and tobacco fields and all of that, indigo, rice, sugar. But you had a, few, a handful, mostly domestic servants, so you have them. And then you have Africans who were brought there by the British, for the most part. And these are Africans who fought in the United States so-called Revolutionary War, and who fought on the side of the British, but who were defeated. So what's going to happen to them? And then you also have Africans from Jamaica, and these were Maroons. These were unruly Africans who wasn't going to accept subjugation. So they shipped them out, and they ended up in a place called Nova Scotia. And you have very small communities up near Halifax, Nova Scotia, really, really far north. And then you have 
more, in more recent times, beginning like in the 1960s, they have a lot of Africans from the Caribbean who were able to go there a lot at that time. You also have black populations going into England, but you got sisters and brothers from Barbados, from Jamaica, from Trinidad, from Grenada, from Guyana. And now you have a new group of Africans coming from the continent itself. You got a bunch of Somalis there, you know, who have kind of like a refugee status. And then you also have sisters and brothers from West Africa, from Ghana and Nigeria in particular. So up there, I just kind of made contact with some of these folks, and they liked me. I guess they didn't know me very well. They liked me. And last year, there was a big program for, for teachers mostly and students, and the emphasis was on science and technology. So this sister who runs this bookstore, she says, well, Renope, you've got a lot of pictures. Can you do it? And I said, sure I can. I wanted the money, to be perfectly honest with you. I told her I could do anything. And they invited, and it went well. And the teachers liked it. And, and mostly the white teachers, because that's who almost all the teachers are up there. Mm -hmm. And so this year, even after I moved, they invited me back. And they invited me to do a series of presentations about to speak in front of about 1,800 students from elementary school to high school and middle school. And I did the program, I modified the program, and they ate it up. And I want to share that with you today, right? That'll be the first presentation. Then we can take a break, you can buy some of my books and DVDs, stretch your legs, whatever you want to do. And then I'm going to do the second part of the presentation, which is uh, are mostly photographs from my recent travels to Greece, uh, to Cameroon, uh, to Colombia, to Mexico, you know, to France. I'm going to show you that. But also, I want to show you pictures from a book that should be out in the spring called Uncovering the African Past, the Ivan Van Sertima Papers. Oh. And most of these pictures will have never been published, but you will, ne you will have never seen them. And I'm going to narrate them. That's what we're going to do. Everybody good with that? I'm going to sit back down. <laughs> so this is the science and technology piece. And I also added um, architecture. So I'm going to do this one relatively quickly and see if you like it. Now this, of course, this is a presentation I gave in Canada. And this also gives you a chance to see how I work, you know, what I do, how I evolve how I interact with different audiences. And this one was for children. Okay. And I wonder how it might work here. Now, this is Carter G. Woodson, a brother who spent a lot of time in Chicago. I believe he went to the University of Chicago. And of course, he's here because he, in 1926, founded Negro History Week, which by 1970 had become Black History Month. And now it's celebrated in different parts of the world. Yeah, Black History Month celebrated in Canada in February. Uh, other places, and the UK is celebrated in October. So they don't have the coldest, shortest month of the year. They got one of the longer months, and the weather's more inclement. Carter G. Woodson, who used to say, and this is very profound, if you control a man's thinking, you don't have to worry about his actions. It's very, very important. And it says a lot about why we should put more emphasis on our history and culture and knowledge of self. I hear people all the time say, Renoko, I don't want, I'm tired of hearing about history. I'm tired of hearing about the past. How does it put money in my pocket? What's it going to do for me? I ain't got no job. I'm afraid to live in my neighborhood. My girlfriend is pregnant. We don't have health care. Blah, 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 blah. Those are very legitimate comments. But what I say over and over and over again is history is the basis of everything. Knowledge itself is the foundation of everything. How do you plan for today and tomorrow if you don't know what happened yesterday? True. You can never put enough emphasis on history and culture. What you do for yourself depends on what you think of yourself. What you think of yourself depends on what you know of yourself. And what you know of yourself depends on what you have been told. So if you're told you don't have the history, which means you don't really measure up as a full human being, then yeah. The N word will roll easily off your tongue. Exactly. The B word comes out naturally. Right. And you will even shoot your sister and brother because you see no value in them. Right. Because you don't see them as being a full human being. Does that make sense? Yeah. I'm sure of that. And then we can see how knowledge self transforms people. The best example is Malcolm X. And this is today we mourn his passing. He was taken from us today. 
Malcolm used to be, although his parents were Garbiites, according to his autobiography, was a common criminal. Let's be real. A thief, drug dealer, burglar. And then he began to find out who he, he was born again. He came under the influence of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. He read Carter G. Woodson in prison and Jay Rogers, and he was transformed into our black shining prince. Who is not proud of Malcolm X? Who does not say that man represented the best of us? But there was a time when it was just the opposite of that. Knowledge of self can transform everything. Once you know who you are, the world opens up to you. All right, so if you control a man's thinking, you don't have to worry about his actions. That brother's going to come through the back door. He's going to look for the back door. And if there is no back door, he will build you up because his orientation dictates that. All right, Carter T. Woodson. And then for the youth, Paul Rosen, who is the greatest football player in the world. The sisters might be inclined to say he's very handsome. Well, I ain't going to say that. I'm not a sister and I don't lean in that direction. But he was the greatest football player in the world. But he graduated that top of his university class. He graduated with a straight 4.0 average from an Ivy League school. I think it was Rutgers. He was an activist, an actor, a singer. He spoke many different languages. And he was about uplifting his people, making the world a better place. Why do I use him? To tell the students, you can be good at more than one thing. Yeah. You can walk and chew gum at the same time and excel in both. A lot of our children are ingrained with the attitude that they can't do but one thing. And maybe not even that. So Rosen proved otherwise. And then here I am with an ancestor now. His name is Dr. Abdullahim Shabazz. And he is probably the greatest mathematician that we have. He went on my last trip to Egypt in July 2011. So much has happened in Egypt since then. I'm going to take it another group um, back next year, God willing. But he went on my trip. He was already past 80. And it was a great honor for him to be on my trip. And here we are in Nubia. He told me he knew Malcolm X. He used to be in the nation. I mean, we talked a lot. And he's a great, great, great mathematician. A lot of our children need to see images like this. Because you don't anticipate, a lot of us, the idea that black people could do things like that. And in Canada, oh, man. And the great Ivan Van Sertima, who was my major teacher. And since he was from the Caribbean or Guyana, they could relate to that. And then Ivan wrote this book, Blacks in Science. Now, some of it is real basic. And sometimes I think it's important that we return to the basics. Sometimes we forget and think everybody knows what we know. But sometimes we just need to be, be real basic. Ivan was, in addition to his book that came before Columbus, the African presence in ancient America, was also um, the editor of the journal, the founding editor of the Journal of African Civilizations. He produced many books, and I worked on most of them. But this is one where I think is one of the most important blacks in science, ancient and modern. So we're going to review some of that. And then I give him a geography lesson. And I say, look here, contrary to popular belief, <laughs> Africa is a big place. Let's break down this mythology, this negative mythology surrounding Africa, because we Africans. I'm not even going to say we have African heritage. We Africans. That's right. That's true. Right. That's true. If you know anything about Africa, you say amen. amen. A lot of us reject Africa, but we don't know nothing about it. Exactly. It's true. And please stop saying Africa was named after a Roman general. That, is, that makes me want to vomit. So. Africa wasn't named after a white man. A white man was named after Africa. Hey, my sister, you want to do a presentation? Father. <laughs> You're absolutely right. So I ask people, I start off by asking people if I have the time, what do you think of when you think of Africa, by the way? You may have heard me go through this routine before. What do you think, what do you think of when you think of Africa? People say poverty. The first answer is almost wild animals. I had a white boy in, in Seattle the other day tell me the jungle. <laughs> this is an adult. <laughs> so, poverty, disease, wild animals. I get that all the time. Every now and then somebody might throw in something else, but you can be guaranteed I'm going to get that. So, I begin to break that down and try to deconstruct that. You know, Africa is where the first people came from. Exactly. Africa is where people first stood on two feet. Yep. Africa is where people first wore clothes. Mm -hmm. 
I reckon that's when people first had a house, not a hut, a house. I reckon that's when people first buried the dead, played music, had art, had mathematics. I reckon that's when people first charted the stars in the heavens, had astronomy, mm -hmm. had science, built a boat, sailed a boat, domesticated animals, domesticated agriculture, domesticated fire. And on and on and on. And then people begin to say, wow, I didn't, I didn't know that. All those things happened in Africa. But maybe Africa isn't so bad after all. We have to count it what we get in the media. When you're looking at Africa on TV, <laughs> you don't see big cities. You don't see traffic jams. Nope. You don't see universities. You see the most negative images. And those things become ingrained in us. So we have to deconstruct that. And I say Africa is a big place. It's not a little place. If you're a simpleton, you're a moron like Sarah Palin or somebody like that. You might think that Africa really was a country. I wish it was. We'd have a lot less problems. But this map just shows the size of Africa. And then again, let me see if we can focus that a little bit. I should probably leave it alone. But leave it alone is something I've never been good at. I guess that's a little better. Again, you can get a sense as to how big Africa is by these various things, countries, entities you can squeeze in there. All of Northern and Western Europe. The United States, China, you better watch out for China. India, Japan, the UK. And then the wealth of Africa. Look at all the things Africa has because you think Africa's poor. It's not Africans are poor because they've been denied access to the resources of Africa, the wealth that would come from it, they're drained out. What does Africa has? Among other things, oil, gas, natural gas, what I call blood diamonds because of the way they're, they're, they're gotten, uranium, <laughs> copper, manganese. I don't even know what manganese is, but it must be important. Coltan. Iron ore and a lot of gold. Now, if we had a good map, a new map, we had coltan on there. Yes, coltan, yeah. The most of the world's resources of coltan come from Central Africa, not all of them. But a lot of it does, and that's what's in your cell phones, and I would imagine in this computer right here. And then, of course, Africa is the birthplace of science, and Africa is the birthplace of humanity. And that's what this picture personifies. Here you have an African scientist, a paleontologist, holding the bones of Dinknesh or Lucy, 3.4 million years old, right? And then mining. This is called lion's cavern, and this is the first mine in the world. You know what a mine is when you dig in the ground? Mm -hmm. This is 47,000 years old. 47,000 years old. Wow. Africans were engaged in mining. And it's kind of a cave or a cavern. Now, Europeans were living in caves at that time. Of course, I didn't say that during the presentation. <laughs> <laughs> Not because black people were only about 30% of the audience. You must be sensitive to the audience. You must be aware of your audience. And the ticket there is, you don't want to compromise your message, but at the same time, you don't want to make enemies. Right. You have the attitude that African history is everybody's history. I pass the point now where I feel the need to call people names and belittle people. You want to at least neutralize them. Right. Okay, very, very important. I learned that over a period of time. I remember I did a presentation in the church a few years ago, and there was a sister with a white friend sitting in the front row. And I said, just because, you know, I don't like white people. <laughs> Not only that, I don't like black people who like white people. No, that's right. Just, just out right. of spite. Now, I believe that. <laughs> but that didn't do any good. That alienated the people who invited me to speak in that church. So I'm kind of like cutting off my nose to spite my face. Now some people say, to hell with that, cut it off. But I think we need to really be sensitive about our situation. Why do you put your head in the lion's mouth if you can't extract it before the lion bites down? All right, and you can take that for whatever it's worth. But I think I've lectured in 60 countries now. And you need to be sensitive about who you're speaking to. But the key is, don't compromise your message, but don't go out of your way to 
create a hostile environment because it's hostile enough as it is. One time, I did a presentation in Los Angeles a number of years ago. It was at a school, a uh, school program, and there were a lot of Jewish teachers there. And I made it a point to say, I'm tired of hearing about the Holocaust, which I am. But that meant that those same people wanted to fire the black people who brought me in. So sometimes it's like if a cop pulls you over, you can say, I don't like these MFN cops, and get your head blown off, if that makes you feel better. But we must be sensitive and strategic and intelligent about what we do. Very true. If we're going to get out of the hole that we're in. And then once we get power, we can do whatever we want to do. All right. Here's something that deals with mass ma mathematics. This is called the Lebombo Plume. This is 37,000 years old. And this is from Swaziland. And then the one that we see most of the time is here. This is my own picture. This is the Ishango Bone. Now this shows black people early in mathematics. This is my own picture. And this is taken in the Natural History Museum in Brussels, Belgium. It's about this big. And what you, look, what you see here are notches carved on the surface of the bone in sequential order. And on the top is a piece of quartz. It was used for computations. This is 25,000 years old, found in Central Africa. Now, I have what was called math anxiety. When I was growing up in South Central Lake, mathematics terrified me. Even now, mathematics is like a foreign language to me. But I often wonder how my confidence level would have changed if I had known that my ancestors were responsible for inventing these very things. So this is Africans and <laughs> mathematics. And then, of course, you have to talk about Imhotep. Mm -hmm. You know, if you were to, I, I think it's important that we be able to name, and I throw this out to the children, give me the name of one African who lived before slavery. Because it's Black History Month, and so most of us are talking about it, slavery and the aftermath of it. African-American heroes and sheroes. Tremendous people. Harriet Tubman, Martin Luther King, Garvey, etc. But they all come after enslavement. Mm -hmm. Didn't we have a history before slavery and colonization? Yes. In fact, that's the majority of our history. Right. So name me an African who lived before slavery. If they think about it, maybe King Tut, or perhaps Akhenaten, or maybe Ramses the Great, or maybe Mansa Musa. But of all of them, this is the one, in my opinion, who stands head and shoulders above them all. That's right. And this is Imhotep. He's the first scientist. Marcus Garvey used to say we must create a race of scientists second to none. I don't think that we emphasize science and technology and mathematics enough. If we are talking about nation building, this is very important, fundamental, and it originated in Africa. And this is the first scientist and the first multigenist before Michelangelo, before Leonardo da Vinci before Einstein, before Isaac Newton, before any of them in Africa was at the top. And this is an image of Imhotep, and this is the monument that he designed, which is the world's first large stone building, also the first pyramid. This is the king under whom Imhotep worked, a man named Djoser, but this is the new one right here. And, ah. That's Imhotep's mother. Hmm. Have you ever seen that picture before? No. I don't think so. I know you didn't see it on the Learning Channel. <laughs> and I'm pretty confident you didn't see her on the History Channel. And I bet you my last dollar she wasn't on BET. <laughs> but that's Imhotep's mother. So if you had any doubts about Imhotep's ethnicity, because this picture right here doesn't really show a lot about what he might have actually looked like. This is 2,000 years after his death. But if your mother looks like that, <laughs> then I think it pretty much tells the story. Look at that happy to be nappy hair. <laughs> Look at that jet black skin. This is a small statuette only about this big in a glass case in the Louvre in Paris. Last spring, I was there wandering through it for the umpteenth time and something just seemed to call me. She seemed to call me. And I turned around and there it was. It's not the best picture because it's in a glass case. But look at the mother of the greatest multi-genius of all time. All right. And then this is another one of Imhotep. Obviously, 
This is the step pyramid, and you can see other pyramids too. Some were constructed better than others. And then from the top, now what I do a lot of times now when, is when I take tour groups, if possible, I will get in a hot air balloon and fly above the monuments. By the way, hot air balloons can make you very religious. <laughs> very, very increase your sense of spirituality. <laughs> but you can also get some great photographs. Look at that. And it shows not only the step pyramid, but the fact that the step pyramid was a part of a city. It wasn't just one isolated building in the desert. All right. And this is the evolution of pyramids. This one is called uh, kind of a truncated pyramid because you can see it's kind of like in the form of a kind of a box placed on top of another. These are early ones. This is a pyramid builder. We think his name is Huni. This is in the Brooklyn Museum of Fine Arts. And then this is called the Bent Pyramid. All this shows the evolution of this. It didn't just pop out of nowhere, but it evolved. That's good for people who like to push the alien theory. Mm -hmm. The aliens came down and did it. If the aliens did, it took them a while to get it together. So Africans did, the people did this, right. and they made mistakes. And they evolved, and they finally got it together. This one is called the Bent Pyramid, and I've been in all of these. And then this is one that's called the Northern Stone Pyramid or the Red Pyramid. And this is the first so-called classic pyramid, a true pyramid. This one is about 4600 BC, at the beginning of the Fourth Dynasty. And it's called the Northern Stone Pyramid because of the location. Sometimes it's also called the Red Pyramid because it's made of red granite. And when the sun starts, it really takes on a reddish hue. It's very beautiful. And I've been blessed to go on all of these. This is the pyramid builder who's responsible for at least the last two, maybe all three of the last ones I showed you. Stephen Room. Now look at here. Look at this one. This is outside the Egyptian Museum in Cairo. Look at those long, slender fingers. Now what's that about? Here are people who didn't do things at random. They didn't just do it because it was cute or pretty. Nor did they pick the, the spots where those pyramids were constructed at random. Those places, everything was well thought out. They didn't do random. They gave it deep thought. So what would be the symbolism of those fingers? I'm not sure. But anyway, it's something that stands out. And this is the Pyramid of Capri. This is actually out of order. Again, from an aerial perspective, there I am in one of the pyramids. And our children need to see these things. That African people can go to these places, that we can be scientists, we can be historians, we can be archaeologists too. And you know, these pyramids are no joke. How many of you have been to Egypt and been in a pyramid tomb? They're no joke. You gotta kinda scrunch down to get down there. One time I made the mistake of being in one of these, sometimes you go up and sometimes you go down. I guess that's like life, huh? And I made a mistake one time going up, of raising my head, and hitting the top. Oh man, I still feel that pain. It's no joke. And you gotta be a little nimble to get down there. And so my pyramid tomb days are probably done. But this one is fairly easy to get in. And this is a pyramid of a man named Teti from the Sixth Dynasty. And you can kind of get down there without too much difficulty. And we have libation ceremonies in there when I take groups. And you can also see the writing on the wall. This is called the Pyramid Text, the earliest known religious literature. So that's what that is. And then this is the Great Pyramid. This is the Pyramid of Khufu. I tell them the stone came from 500 miles away. Let's suppose you're going to build something here in Chicago. Maybe you have to go to Kansas City to get the building material. And you carve it out of the quarry and put the stones on a barge and sail them down the Nile and take them to the, and then offload them near the construction site, put them on a boat on a canal, and ship the stones to the construction site where they were fitted together. That takes skill. That takes organization. 2.3 million blocks of hard granite stone just for this one building. And they weren't cemented together. They were cut in such a precise manner that you fit them together like you fit the pieces of a puzzle. And then we emphasize these weren't built by slaves. These were built by free Africans. And you laugh and make them comfortable. There I am again. And the pictures don't do it justice. You know if you've been there, 
you look at these pyramids on the Giza Plateau, at least for me, and say, could humans have done something like this? Uh, Khufu, one of the great pyramid builders, and then you see the three of them. You emphasize they weren't built by slaves, they were built by free African people. How long it took, about 70 years, this is the, the Great Pyramid, also known as Khufu on the horizon, that's the builder, Khufu, Khafre, Minkare. These are pyramids of the women, so you talk about the importance of women. You want, don't want to leave the sisters out. You want to elevate black women whenever you get right. the opportunity. Right. Right, right. Right. And true. then you laugh with them. You say, we even know what they ate. We know the vacation time they had. We know the oil that they were given to anoint their bodies. We know the kind of sandals they wore. We know they were the first people to roast marshmallows. I know that drives the vegans crazy. They were the first people to roast marshmallows. And we even know their nicknames. Some of these sisters and brothers had nicknames like BB and Mimi and Didi. Straight out of the hood. And the children just laugh tremendously. Because what you want to do is get them involved. You don't want to preach at them. You want to interact with them. You want them to feel like they are part of a journey. That works for me. And then another one. And one more. And that's probably what they really looked like when they were finished. They were covered with another kind of stone, the granite with a kind of a limestone. And you would polish it and buff it and shine it until it gleamed like a diamond. Now imagine a diamond 486 feet high. Imagine a diamond taking up 13 acres of land. And then the sun came out. And there were no clouds in the sky. That's what African people did. So by this time they'd forgotten that stuff about the jungle, about starving people about poverty, about disease. You remember a couple months ago, we were all gonna die from Ebola. We were all gonna be dead within a matter of weeks. Close the border, don't let them Africans over here. Now you didn't even hear about it. But there's a constant bombardment about Africa negativity, Absolutely. Boko Haram, right, right. corruption. Bring our girls back, constant, constant negative. So we are taught to be anti-African 24 right. seven. And many of us embrace that. Yep. And many of us would rather, I'm convinced of it, would rather be called a turd in a toilet than an African. I've heard people say, thank God for slavery, because we can still be in Africa. We can be like those Africans. If not for slavery, we would have never met Jesus. Slavery wasn't so bad, because at least we had, un we, we had full employment. We wasn't hungry. And so you begin to justify your own oppression. Right, right. You begin to say, well, the enslaver wasn't so bad after all, because at least he got us out of Africa. But when you're reminded of the greatness of Africa, your perspective changes. I mean, big time. Look at that diamond. 13, 13 acres, 486 feet high. I know it's just Valentine's Day. I think it was a pagan holiday anyway. But a lot of people be wanting to get some chocolate or a flower or something. Now imagine a diamond. All right, you got the point. <laughs> we don't want to overdo it. Now look here. If you really want to appreciate Egypt and the importance of Egypt, one of the things you have to look at is the Nile River. The Nile River is the longest river on earth, twice the length of the Mississippi. And it starts in Central Africa. I should get a picture of me standing by the bank of the Nile. That would be nice. I'll add that. See, things are growing all the time. Anyway, and I look good on the bank of the Nile. Anyhow. It starts in Central Africa, so you make it clear that ancient Egypt was not an isolated entity. It was a part of Africa. Herodotus, the Greek father of history, says that Egypt was the gift of the Nile. But the Nile is the gift of Africa. It starts in Central Africa, and along the banks of the river, great mighty cities develop. And Africans also constructed boats because of the importance of the Nile. Even boats were considered important in the next life, the so-called afterlife because they believed you would need the same thing in the next life that you had in this one. And so Africans are the first boat builders. Africans are virtually the first in everything. That's right. Because that's where the first people came from. Exactly. Exactly. So it stands the reason they did almost everything first. Right. <laughs> because that's where humanity began. That's where culture began. That's where civilization began. Absolutely. And this is the oldest preserved boat that I'm aware of. It's certainly one of them. It's 120 feet long. And when it was constructed, it was taken apart 
buried in a tomb of its own with instructions left as to how to reassemble it. Wow. And that's the tomb. You can't really get a sense of how big those rocks are. But believe me, they're like 30, 40, 50 tons each. One single piece of stone. And it was buried in there and reconstructed with instructions. A pyramid builder, Cochre, Cochre again. And Cochre is important because most people think that he was responsible for the construction or carving of the monument that we call Hormachal of the Great Sphinx. If he didn't do it, he refurbished it. He put his own touch on it. All right, good, that's perfect. You know, when people start handing you notes, you get a little nervous you have to read them. But you know Leonard Jeffries? What he does, oh, yeah. somebody hands him a note, he just takes it and throws it behind the back. Arrogance. Man, and, they're, and they're paying him. Yeah. 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 All right. So, <laughs> And after that, you don't hand him any more notes. But you also don't invite him the next time. <laughs> you want to feel like he's disrespectful. I like Dr. J. See him, tell him I said hi. Now, this is Giza, and what you have is this magnificent monument. Some people think it's much, much, much older than the Fourth Dynasty in Cochrane, but it's pretty old. It has the head of a lion and the body of a king. And that's a nice shot. The moon, pyramid, all that. Another one, you know, it used to be painted. Really? Yeah, you know that? These monuments used to be painted. It used to be painted red, black, green, oh. and blue. <laughs> and yellow. <laughs> but the red, black, and green was in there anyway. And then from the side, I think this is my own picture. And this is a picture a tour guide gave me. So the closer you get, the closer, I mean, the more African it looks. Look at that. Isn't that interesting? It's also, it also gives you an idea as to the size of it. Of course, we are told that Napoleon <coughs> did that, but that's simply not true. This photograph was done. Come on, Renoko. Uh oh, skip it. Uh, I may not be in here. I'll show, show you that in the next presentation. We'll talk about Napoleon and whether or not he did it. Here's a view of the Giza Plateau. Nice one. A power couple. I love, a few things I love more in life is to talk about the importance of black men and black women being together. Yes. If you have a problem with that, don't even come up to me. Well, after you buy one of my books and DVDs, then don't come up to me. <laughs> but I love black love. I love the concept of black love. How do you talk about African liberation if we can't even get that together? Right. If we cannot love each other, have respect for each other, honor each other, then what can we do? That's basic and fundamental. Absolutely. And when I post this on Facebook and say black men need to be with black women, you're talking about a brother who gets cussed out. <laughs> 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 See, that's why I say you have to be sensitive to your audience. Sometimes you just don't that's care. Funny, right. That's one of the ones I don't really care too much about. Right. People say, Dr. Renoko, we love you. We think you're doing a wonderful job. <laughs> and maybe that's just human nature. How do we change the world if we're not prepared to change ourselves? Exactly. We have to change our worldview, our habits, our spending habits. Every black man should desire to be with a black woman. Yes. There's no if and buts about that. Exactly. If you're going to worship a God, that God, it seems to me, should look like you. Not the people who oppress you. Organize and control the educational institutions in your community. We have to police our own communities. We have to get organized. Exactly. These are basic things. Go to Africa, visit it, see it, smell it, experiment with a traditional African religion. Because if you keep doing the same things, you're going to get the same results. This is Minkare and his queen, one of the pyramid builders. Tahotep, who was credited with having written the first book in the world. And this is the tomb of Tahotep. Look how bright and vivid those colors are. This is 4,500 years old. It's a car. Myself in one of those tombs. Again, I want the children to see it. It's not just boasting. Although it does make me feel good to look at myself on the screen. I like that. It brings back fond memories. But mostly you want the children to want to do it. You want to encourage them to travel and see the world for themselves. I have one child. She's nine years old. She's already been to Africa five times. She said, Daddy, I want to live in Africa. Wow. I'm a proud papa. I got one child, and I adore this child. 
even though sometimes you want to throw off the tall building. <laughs> 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 you can't show them what you're to You love them, but sometimes you say, damn, what was I doing? <laughs> and now we want to talk about the sisters, Maka Rahab Shetsu, a female pharaoh, not the only one, but the most significant one, who was also, that's her architect, let me see. This is, all right, let's just go back to the sequence. I have time. Let me get another note in a minute. Uh, this is a sphinx of Hapshesset. All the kings and queens, all the kings had to have sphinxes. It wasn't uncommon. The whole market is just the biggest one. But they all had them. Here you have a pink granite sphinx of Makare Hapshesset in front of the Egyptian Museum of Cairo. This is one of my best photographs. Look at the greenery. It's a nice contrast. And the orangish, pinkish facade of that old, old building. And there's my sister. And here is her significant other, but also her architect uh, and steward, a man named Cinema, who was also a teacher. And this is Hapshetsu's daughter that's popping up out of there. You can see the protective concept of the teacher. And nothing's going to happen to that child. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things in our schools, too. The children must feel safe. They must feel, they must be in an environment I think that they feel safe and that they're really going to excel. And that's a real issue in our community. When I go to a school here, I have to pass a metal detector. Thank God. All right. And Nepharos, her name, the root of the word is Nefer, a word, N-E-F-E-R, which means beauty. So Nephera, Nefertiti, Nefertari are rooted in that. And then this is what he did for his queen, his significant other. Look at that carved a temple out of a solid mountain to last for all time. That's what I call I just, again, I just love the concept of black love. I'm very romantic in that sense. My mother was a black woman. I mean, what else you want me to say? I love to see black people together. Because it's almost becoming rare in many cases. Exactly. Yes. Yes. And then people say, you're a racist, Renoko. And then the next moment they say, there's no such thing as race. Oh, you know what really drives me crazy? When I hear a person say, you can't help who you fall in love with. That's cold language for saying, I chose to be with a non-black man. You were walking down the street, a moron, <laughs> and Cupid shot you with an arrow. Okay? And you decided I had to have a blonde because you couldn't help. Come on. God, how insulting is that language? We make choices. All right, this is Hapshetsu's obelisk or Tekken at Karnak Temple. Isn't that beautiful? And you can compare it to the Washington Monument in Washington, D.C. Somebody got it from somewhere. Right, right. And then here's one that uh, Hapshetsu was working on. Her, she had her engineers digging it out, and it developed a crack. This was going to be the biggest one of all. And it developed a crack, so they left it in there. They wanted it to be perfect. <laughs> so the concept of perfection, excellence, not just good enough, mediocrity, it's OK, it'll do. It's very prevalent in the mindsets of our community. And there it is again. And then you can compare it again to the Washington Monument, which is made up of a lot of little pieces. This is just one solid piece of stone. That's one piece. This is a bunch. And you can compare it to the reflection pool. I mean, the reflection pool in DC to the sacred lake at Karnak, which is where the concept of baptism is supposed to have come from. And then just the temples, the architecture of Egypt. This is, what temple is this? I think this is Edfu. And that's the temple of Heheru, a god. It's a female aspect of God. At a place called Dendera. And this is the island of Philae. And these are temples dedicated to Aset and Heheru, Isis yes. and Hathor. And this was closed by the Romans about 500 AD, about 500 years into the Christian <coughs> era. Isn't that beautiful? And Philae means love, so this is the island of love. And Africans constructed that. African family at the height of ancient Egypt, the height of Kemet. Amenhotep III also called Egypt's dazzling sun because he was so important. 
and his wife and Queen Queen Ty, and even some of the children down there. 60 feet high. Don't you look happy to be together? <laughs> you don't see that in Greco Roman art, though. Rarely do you see a man and a woman together. <laughs> in that society, a dog was a man. Do you know that Plato thought that romantic love between a man and a woman was a form of insanity? I'm going to repeat that. Plato, the Greek philosopher, thought that romantic love between a man and a woman was a form of insanity. He thought people must be crazy. He thought that the ideal relationship was an older man and a young boy. That's right. That's right. And that was a platonic relationship. See, y'all watch it when you say, I just want a platonic relationship, because a lot of you don't know what you're talking about. Right. <laughs> and he's even a little, she's even a little taller than him. I've been in that situation many times. You get comfortable with it. <laughs> Here he is. Y'all are a little slow. This is the third. Again, this one is in Berlin. And there's the famous queen time. Got to show that one. She's the much, she's the wife of a king, the mother of a king, the grandmother of a king, the mother-in-law of a queen, Nefertiti. And there she is, black African woman. This is my own picture. It's in Berlin. These are, let me finish this one up. These are statues of Amenhotep III, the brother I just showed you. That's Queen Ty. The king is almost always going to be portrayed larger than life. And the reason this is here, these were 60 feet high. Every morning at sunrise, for over a thousand years, these statues made a whistling or singing sound. There was something about the engineering. So that when the sun came up, they began to sing. At least this one did. Engineers could not figure it out. It was called the Colossi of Memnon. That's your story. Really? This is the ruined palace of Nefertiti, in which I'm in front of in the middle of the desert. Tutankhamun, gold with lapis lazuli. I used to think that was blue enamel. And one of the students, students will do it. They say, it's actually not paint, sir. <laughs> it's actually lapis lazuli that's placed there. And I said, thank you so much. And it's like a 10-year-old kid. Wow. <laughs> yeah. You can learn from anybody <laughs> if you open yourself up to it and you can teach anybody. Dr. King and King Tut, a king and a king. King Tut's golden sandals. So it took some knowledge about metal alloy to do something like that. I don't know how comfortable they were, but they looked good. <laughs> Ramses the Great, who reigned for 66 years, a great builder. Signed the world's peace, first peace treaty, not first peace treaty. Signed an early peace treaty. These gigantic statues of him in the city of Memphis, after whom Memphis, Tennessee is named. This is the Temple of Luxor. Those are statues of Ramses the Great in front. And one of those obelisks are taken, which is a, was a kind of a clock. You tell what time of day it was by the shadow caused by the reflection of the sun. It had other functions as well. The other one, the companion, is now in Paris. And it's a phallic symbol. Do I need to illustrate that it's a phallic symbol? Absolutely. Well, some of us, of course, you get to a certain point when that's wishful thinking, but it's a, a phallic symbol. <laughs> <laughs> Don't look at me now. <laughs> <laughs> and then this is my daughter, because they said, oh, you have a child, she's young, she's like us. You can, we can relate. And I'm so proud of this. My daughter's mother posted this on Facebook. My child, in the, in the bitter winter cold, December last year, standing in front of the Eiffel Tower with a sign, we are Mike Brown. I was so wow. proud of that. Yeah. Here's a comparison. This is, these are the statues of Ramses the Great at Abu Simbel. And then you can compare them to Mount Rushmore. Because the so-called founding fathers in this country, well, most of them are Rosicrucians and Masons. They understood the importance of They may not have said the ancient Egyptians were black now, don't get me wrong. After all, they were slave owners. Yep. Thomas yep. Jefferson and George Washington and Lincoln. And then Teddy Roosevelt, who was also a racist. But certainly there's no question where the inspiration came from. Right. There they are again. And then here's a good point. This temple, and you have the entrance to the temple, 
the temple, why did they, how were the Africans able to do this? They didn't have electricity. Some people think they did, but there's no real evidence for it. And there's no smudges from smoke inside the temple. So how did they have the light? So they took mirrors and lined them up so that the light from the sun reflected inside. Now every year on the king's birthday, and it doesn't even now, the entire interior of this temple, which is a huge interior, is naturally illuminated with sunlight. Oh, these Africans had something going on. But you thought Africa was primitive. You thought Africa was where Tarzan lived. <laughs> Here's one that just shows Seti the first and Ramses the second. Let me finish this up real quick. These met, this is at a place called Abydos, and then you have this place called the Osirion in the black. In the back, it's believed that Osiris was either born there or died there. Look at those massive stones. Again, the picture does not do it justice. Here's something in there that I can't figure out inside that temple. What does it look like? What does it look like? What does it look like? But this is 3,000. I can't explain it. The tour guys say the hieroglyphs are damaged. My picture close up. A glider. This is real. This is 300 BC. It's disappeared now. In the Arab Spring, when the Egyptian Museum was ransacked, this disappeared. I'm sure it was an inside job. Here's a model glider, 2,300 years old. NASA went to Egypt and built a replica of it and said it flies like a B-52. This is 2,300 years before the Wright Brothers. <laughs> Here's one. I love books. Put a book in my coffin and a laptop and a couple other items, and I won't bother y'all anymore. <laughs> I hope we don't have to deal with that any time in the foreseeable future. I love books. The libraries were my sanctuary in school. I was a shy, nerdy little kid, and I could take refuge in the library. And then I found out that an African woman was identified as the first librarian. Her name is Sheshat. You know what her title is? Among other things, she's an accountant. She was the wife of the figure called Yehuti. But you know what her title is? And I love this. The Mistress of the House of Books. Oh, man. The Mistress of the House of Books. A black woman with a star over her head. And look at this one. Now, this is a prosthetic toe. Okay, I saw that. Oh, wow. Yeah, I saw that. So if the prosthetic toe is painted like this, what does this tell you about the ethnicity of the people? That's a powerful image. Somebody sent that to me on the internet. <coughs> 3,000 years old, an African woman who's been mummified and mummy unwrapped and photographed. That tells you about the ethnicity, but it also introduces the children to the concept of mummification, which they get a kick out of, because they see it on TV, a mummy. So you want to engage the youth. You don't want to just talk at them. You want to share with them. And these are canopic jars that were used to put the internal organs of the deceased. Here are medical instruments. You can even see a kind of a stethoscope right there. And these are images that, ah, oh, I guess I didn't put it in there. This is an older presentation. I've modified a little bit. This is almost Nefertari, and again, you can see what she looked like, like what she looks like now. Look at those extensions. This is a powerful sister right here. Is that real hair? It's real. Well, they may be extensions. <laughs> but at least she didn't get them from the... Koreans. <laughs> you said that. <laughs> now, this one I didn't use. I put this in later. These are, this is an image of Aset. You know it's her because she has a throne on her head. The name Aset means the throne. And this is the woman that the Greeks call Isis. And they're on birthing stools. I didn't use that in the classrooms. I didn't think that would be appropriate. Here, people, children probably know more about it than I do. But I thought that maybe we'd leave that alone. And here you can see the actual baby popping out. Wow. So Africans were active in medical science. And then, since there were a lot of Somali students in the audience, that say this is probably what the people of Egypt look like. So know your audience. Be able to make them relate. And then here's one. You see? So the ancients don't look so mysterious. You have a comparison. Quickly, Renoko, finish up. Pyramids from Sudan. 
And in other parts of Africa, an obelisk in uh, Ethiopia, I'm taking a group in May, come with me if you can. This one I think is in Turkey. Sure. Just quickly, yeah, they took it. During the time of the Romans. A stone city in southern Africa, and the impl implication that you want to create is civilization in Africa was continent wide. It wasn't just in Egypt, it was all over the place. Literacy. I've shown you some examples already, but these are the Timbuktu manuscripts. And yes, I've even been able to examine some of those books. Hold them in my hand. Rare, rare, rare thing. From Nigeria, because a lot of students are from different parts of Africa, they can't relate to Egypt. Nigeria is important because it's the most populous country in Africa. In Ghana, some of the students are from there. And it shows, no, not all Africans are poor. This brother has so much bling, he needs help to lift his arm up. <laughs> and then let's leave Africa and show Africans and their imprint in different parts of the world. Let's go to Mexico, we're in the Americas. And of course, you have to look at these stone heads. There are 17 of these. I photographed 15 of them last summer. I'm going back to Mexico next month. I'm going to find those last two. I'm going to photograph, otherwise I won't be able to sleep. <laughs> Of course, we are told they don't exactly look like black people. Hmm. You, you look at these, who could do in their right mind and say that? But many uh, archaeologists say they don't look like black people. So you show some comparison. You show this one with Shaquille O'Neal. I know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I go back and forth. I'm not sure you you've got the children in the palm of your hand. Yeah. And this one is, is the one with the braids in the back. And I tell them the story, of course, we're told that the reason they look like that is, um, is that um, there was a massive earthquake. We're told that he looked, they used to have long noses and thin lips. I said, oh, that's interesting. Why do they look like that now? Because there was a big earthquake. An earthquake caused the heads to roll around in the mud for a long time. And when they start rolling, they look like black people. Yes. And I tell people that if you want to get your hair braided but your money is short, wait for an earthquake and roll around. And then you save money, you can buy one of Renoko's books. Go on one of his books. And then look, straight out of the hood. So what you going to say? What you going to say? What you gonna say? <laughs> what are you going to say? <laughs> oh, wow. So, if he doesn't have African features, he don't have African features. Of course, I don't say he don't. He doesn't have African features either, children. And they laugh. And then this one, I don't know if this has anything to do with Africa at all, but it's ancient technology. Here I am in Peru. I'm not ancient. Well, actually, I think I am. I think I'm an old soul. But here I am in the highlands of Peru. Look at those massive blocks, mm -hmm. solid stone. It took a lot of skill to be able to move those and place them like that. Am I right or wrong? Yes. Right. Yeah. This is a place called Saxy Woman. Sounds like sexy woman. <laughs> <laughs> and then there are a lot of Cambodians. Be sensitive to the audience. If you're doing a presentation, gear it, not just for what you want, but in a way that they'll receive it. So since there's a lot of Southeast Asians who don't think they have anything to do with black people, Take them to Cambodia, take them to Angkor, and show them the imagery. And I say, oh, this is my first book in French. You know, you wrote a book in French? Yeah, there it is. From Cambodia. Look. From Vietnam, because there's a few Vietnamese in the room. And China. The Chinese have been sitting off in a corner by themselves, thinking this ain't got nothing to do with them. So I tell them African history is everybody's history. That artist diaspora began before enslavement. Here's from ancient China, a, a libation vessel showing a tiger protecting a small black man, the first people in China. That's from the formative phase in Chinese history. And then there's a lot of South Asians. So we go to Pakistan and show them a city that black people built and show them what those people look like in the Punjab today. And in India, looking cool, in, I think, in front of the Taj Mahal. One of the world's most famous buildings, which was built for an African woman, built for an Ethiopian woman. <coughs> this sister, who this, who's in, this mausoleum was built for, died in childbirth. She was from Ethiopia. And the Mughal emperor, a man named Shah Jahan, was so beset by grief that he built this temple, or this mausoleum, which is called Poetry and Marble. And so everybody gets a piece of it. 
everybody realizes that Africans have impacted them. And then in Europe, the Andromeda Galaxy, the biggest galaxy in the solar system. And again, which according to the Greeks was named after a black woman. Did you know that the largest galaxy in the solar system, the Andromeda Galaxy, is named after an Ethiopian princess? The Greeks thought Andromeda was the daughter of the king and queen of Ethiopia. This says it in Greek mythology. <laughs> and I photographed this one at Oxford University. And then in Europe, the Moors. The Moors reintroduced civilization to Europe after the fall of the Roman Empire. Algebra. Agricultural science, apples and oranges, basic hygiene. Because Europeans at that time thought that bathing was a form of vanity. It was a sin. Yes. And people would boast that they had lived their entire lives and never washed once. It was a, a thing to boast about. You can document that. You don't have to take Renoko's word for it. I encourage you to go research everything I've said. And this is the last struggle of the Moors called the Alhambra in the city of Brandon. Finally, the Dogon. You heard of them? Yes. A Dogon elder and a sister who looks like she's got an attitude. <laughs> and the Dogon, of course, we know about them. There are people in West Africa and Mali who have a knowledge of astronomy that's astounding, and particularly about Sirius B, a star that's invisible to the naked eye. They have a 700-year tradition of it. They know what it's made out of. They know about its orbital patterns, and yet they don't have telescopes. And that's where they live, up in the cliffs of Mali. And by the way, the richest man that ever lived was an African from Mali named Mansa Musa. And then the enslavement process. And this is what made us forget, many of us, that we had a history before slavery. This is Amina. So you talk about enslavement, and you show them images of the infant's dungeon, where children were kept. Can you imagine a dungeon for children? Can you imagine your child calling you, Daddy, Mama, where are you? I'm scared. Come get me. I'm hungry. I'm cold. Where are you? And this went on for hundreds of years. No wonder we're crazy. Who wouldn't be crazy? It's true. It's we don't deal with it. We would like to think nobody could be that cruel as to enslave a child. She created a dungeon for babies. We don't talk about it. There was a time when we could not protect our woman. I wonder if that's why sometimes we have problems with relationships today. I think so. All right. And then how we were packed away. Maybe 300 of us put in a, a space, each person maybe this much space. So if you were a tall brother or sister, you had a problem. And maybe this much space, and maybe five of these stacked on top of each other. For six weeks or two months or however long it took to cross the ocean, no toilets, no air conditioning in the hold of a ship. Imagine the stench. Imagine the feces. Imagine the urine. Imagine the blood. Imagine the rats gnawing on you. You're in chains. Imagine laying on the bottom of that for six weeks. And in spite of that, Africans excelled. In spite of it. What a remarkable people we are. In terms of science, Louis Latimer, who experimented with electricity, and Ernest Everett Just, a marine biologist, and Charles Drew, a, a, a pioneer blood plasma. And then sometimes the children say, oh, but he doesn't look black. And so you tell them we range in complexion from snow to crow and bright to night for different reasons. That's one thing I like about the one drop rule. I don't care how light you are, how dark you are, you are a member of a club. And you might as well get comfortable with it. And Garrett Morgan, who invented the traffic light and the stop sign. Africans invented so many things. Potato chips. Mashed potatoes. Gas mask. Stop light. Or traffic light, etc., etc. And then Carter G. was, I'm sorry, George Washington Carter, the greatest of them all. Yes. Garrett Morgan again. Garrett Morgan. Check out the joke. This way you take them back to Africa. You don't want to get too far from Africa. An African scientist, Sheikh Hunter Joe, who's not just a great scholar, but who organized, who built a radiocarbon laboratory in Dakar, Senegal. 
And Bessie Coleman and A. Gatrix, I think I just put her in there because I like Bessie Coleman. And Mae Jameson, a black woman. You want to bring the sisters back. You don't want to get too far from the Uplift the black woman. Show the black girls that they're capable of achievement just like the black boys are. Push that hard. And show an African-American astronaut who is also a scientist. And what's your motto? If you know who you are, you can aim for the stars. And the beauty of Africa. But also the possibility of Africa. This is mostly Otunia, Victoria Falls, the smoke of thunders. Imagine the hydroelectricity. It could, it could power the whole of the African continent. So the potential of Africa and the beauty of Africa. And then you end with that. Our history did not begin in shame and will not end in shame. And if you do it right, you make them laugh. You demand that they respect you and you give that respect in return. You show a lot of pictures, you keep it moving. You emphasize the importance of women. You tell them that Africa, his, Africa's history is everybody's history. And then you take a bunch of questions and they think you're the greatest thing that ever lived. It left me with the impression these presentations in Canada that if we can reach our youth, we can change the world. But we've got to get them when they're young, before these, these negative ideas have embedded themselves in the minds of our children. But we can change this. We can do anything we want to do. But you must have a knowledge of self. You must have a sense of pride. And everything springs from that, all right? Hotel. Thank you Thank very much. Woo! is less than 300 years old and it seems old but imagine 3,000 years and so um, I've heard that I'd like to see more evidence you know I think that the Arabs are not good custodians of African culture and they're about making money you know it's a source of revenue and then you have some fanatical people in Egypt and other countries that don't even care about that they think that it's all a form of idolatry and it needs to be destroyed. So on the one hand, you have people who see it as a way of generating income, it's a cash cow. And other people saying, to hell with it, we need to blow it all up. And these are not African people. All right, all right let's do part two. We can turn the lights back off, please. Now this time I can't mess around too much, I'm gonna have to get right on it. Alexandria. And a man they called Egypt's dazzling sun. I showed you another image of him, but this is an original. This is Namare Amenhotep III. This is in the Cleveland Museum of Art. Look at that hair. And he's the husband of Queen Ty. So this is another one of Queen Ty. This is in the Louvre. And this is Queen Ty again. This is in New York City. There are more images of him and her, her and him, than any other figures in ancient Egyptian history. More than King Tut, more than Ramses, more than any of them. And these are their, two of their daughters. I love that. This is in Berlin. And look at how realistic it is. Tell me over 3,000 years old now. Akhenaten. This is a fragment of his face. The person who's credited with saying, that there's only one God. I think Africans always understood that God was one, but that there were different aspects of God. Exactly. A 
feminine aspect, an aspect that dealt with the intellect, an aspect that dealt with strength, an aspect that dealt with one aspect of humanity or another. Not gods and goddesses, but aspects of the one God. And this is a beautiful fragment of the face of Akhenaten, and this is in um, an Egyptian museum in Munich, Germany. Nefertiti. Not the one you used to see. This one is in Cleveland. Oh, man, I love that piece right there. This is one of the daughters of Akhenaten and Nefertiti. She's called an Amarna princess because Tel Amarna is the archaeological site where these pieces apparently were found. And this one's also in Munich. Look at the shape of the head. Now, if I post it on Facebook, somebody's going to say she was an alien. <laughs> A YouTube scholar. This is Seti the First. I only, I've only started showing this within the last week. And this is just interesting because of that burnished color. And this is probably what a lot of those statues look like. Very dark, brownish, reddish color. Seti the First is the father of a man named Ramses the Great. And here is Ramses. This is in Munich, Germany, in the form of a sphinx. I showed you this one before. A gigantic statue. It's laying down. It's flat. Of Ramses in a place called Memphis. It's huge. And this one is in Warsaw, Poland, in the Archaeological Museum. That was a lonely trip for Renoko Rashid. I was in Poland, <laughs> I think, for four days. I flew into Krakow. I went to Warsaw. I went to see the Black Madonna in Chestahova. And during that period of time, I think I saw four black people the whole week. <laughs> and three of them were together at one time. <laughs> Not many black people in Poland. From the Ramesseum on the west bank of the Nile in Luxor. This is Nefertari. Now remember, there are many women with names similar to that. There's Nefera, there's Nefura, there's Nefertiti, there's Amos Nefertari. This is Nefertari, the wife of Ramses the Great. And this is at uh, Luxor Temple. Look at the hair. And this is the son of um, Ramses the Great, or Ramses the Second. And his name is Kemwaset. He was a magician. This is in the loop. He was a magician, and he was an archaeologist. He set about restoring all the ancient temples and monuments of Egypt. Because even by the time he comes to us, which is about 1250 BC, I mean, his father outlived him. His father lived a long time. But he comes to us about 1250 BC, about 3,250 years ago. The pyramids were already more than 1,000 years old, the ones on the Giza Plateau. So he said about the restoration of those buildings, a beautiful uh, photograph of Ramses, two of the uh, statues of Ramses and Abu Simbel. Ramses the third. Here's one named Cairo Mama. Sweet Mama, Cairo Mama. And this is in the loop. This is from the 20th dynasty. This is Amenirdus. She was the most powerful woman in the world. She was the governor or governess of the largest city in the world, or the largest city in Africa, which probably meant the world. A city called Waset. Powerful woman. I cannot say enough good things about black women. I could talk about black women until the, my tongue stiffens in my mouth. To me, you all are wonderful. You're not just beautiful. You are majestic. You are graceful, you are intellectual, you are dynamic. You kept the family together sometimes when the brother couldn't be there. And I cannot say enough good things about black women. And any brother who doesn't want a black woman should be sent to a psychiatric institute. <laughs> this is from a place called Benton and I'm going to tell him I said that. I referred you to a psychiatrist. <laughs> Maybe Francis Wilson can help you. <laughs> this is Taharka in the uh, British Museum in London. Now again, God knows what's in the basement of these museums. Because white folks have been stealing for a long time. And this one is in the uh, Nubian Museum in Aswan. Taharka also. Look at this one. Now this is brand new. This is an African pharaoh that almost nobody talks about. His name is Amasis. And I took this in August. 
in the Capitolini Museum in Rome. I bet you never even heard of the Capitolini Museum. I've been there before. This was the second chair, but I didn't see. Look at that piece right there. This one is from the 26th Dynasty. And this is a powerful figure. My goodness. Cleopatra the seventh. If you ever wonder what Cleopatra looked like, there you go. You don't have to wonder no more. This is in the Louvre. So all of these are pictures, or most of them in the book, all originals. I didn't show you anything so far that isn't an actual original. Well, I take a lot of pride in it. And of course, I show this one all the time. The publisher says maybe we shouldn't use it. I said, look here. This is going in the book. Is this is a picture of Jesus. Ain't it black? With an afro. It's in the Coptic Museum in Cairo. At least it used to be. Now, I took this picture myself. I think I've told you the story. I'm in the museum. I see it. Got to have a photograph of it, even though the sign says no photography allowed. <laughs> But you, at the time, you didn't have to go through a metal detector. Oh. So you hold on to your camera, and you see it, and your eyes start to go around in your head. <coughs> and you wait until nobody is around. <laughs> and you, 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 you put your hand in the bag. <laughs> and you pull it out. All the time, your head is going around like the little girl, Linda Blair, in the Exorcist, right? <laughs> and when you don't see anybody, pull it out and you focus it. And just before I did that, an Arab Museum official came out of nowhere oh and hollered at me, no photographer allowed, can't you read the sign? Now my temptation, I was tempted to holler back. I'm good at that. I have a bad time. I've been fighting it all my life. It's no good. Instead, I gave him a dollar and said, okay. I gave him another dollar. He said, use a flash. Jesus emerging from his tomb after the crucifixion in color. You know that's going in the book. Look at the halo over his head. Wow. That's, that's All right. A picture. This is a, an aspect of God, a feminine aspect of God called moot. It's from the name moot that we get the word mother, etymologically. Now, this is in Oxford, too, the Osmodian Museum at Oxford University. This is right here at the Oriole Institute. For those who came to the museum, and I wasn't there, I hope you got a chance to see it. For those who came to the museum, I hope you say we're no call. The presentation you gave in the museum was life changing. I've never heard information like that. You're wonderful. You're, greatest, you're the greatest scholar who ever lived. I'm just joking. <laughs> <laughs> this is Hey Hey Rue, that door. <laughs> the golden one, the queen of heaven, a nurturing deity. And then here's the one I showed you at the beginning that we used on the cover of the book. I said in Hebrew. This one is from Carthage, the African city of Carthage. Now, the Carthaginians were virtually eradicated by the Romans. And the Romans built a new city called Carthage, but it was a Roman city. This is from African Carthage, one of the few pieces that survived. This is in the Bardo Museum in London. I'm sorry, the Bardo Museum in Tunis, Tunisia. Nice, isn't it? I should have used a better picture because I eventually got a, a better one, but it's still pretty good. This is from Sumer, and Sumer is in Iraq. We're out of Africa now. Look at that hair. Sumerians call themselves the black-headed people. And Sumer is in what is now southern Iraq, and it represents the first great civilization outside of Africa. Oh, man. By the way, this is in the Louvre. And this is in, uh, the nose is missing, look at the hair. It's a figure named Gudia, who lived about 4,200 years ago. But look at this one right here. This is from Canaan, from Lebanon. It's about the size of a license plate, like a little silver license plate. That's one of the most beautiful pieces ever. An original. I couldn't have done any better if I got the postcard. You can see the Ankh down here at the bottom. Purely comedic, purely Nile Valley, but this is not in Africa. This is in West Asia 3,000 years ago. Oh. From China. Now, I showed you a similar one, and there are two of them, but they're not the same. Now, let's see if I have the other one. Yeah. This is the one that I saw first. This one is in Paris. It's in a museum called the Genucci Museum. 
and it's called a tigress. And it shows an image of a tiger holding a small black man. I showed you a variation of it in the first presentation. But what I found out less than a year ago, there's more than one. And I did some research, I love to research. I did some research and I found this one. This one is in the Sumitomo Collection in Kyoto, Japan. And it's a bronze libation vessel of a tiger protecting a small black man. This is at the dawn of Chinese history. This is over 3,000 years old. And I did some research and I found out there was another one. So I got in touch with the museum in Japan and I told them that I wanted to, I couldn't get the picture any other way. And I haven't been to Kyoto before. I've been in Japan two or three times, but I haven't been to that part of Japan. Maybe I'll get a chance to go later this year. So I took, asked them if I could get a catalog. They said yes, and it cost so many yen. And I said, I can pay you via PayPal, or they said, no, we don't do that. And you have to pay us in yen. Well, it ain't like I got a bunch of Japanese yen in my pocket, you know, with nothing to do. So they said, who are you? I said, I'm a, I'm a professor, I'm a writer. They said, you are? And they said, well, what if we sent you a copy of it complimentary? And they sent me the book for free. Oh. And I thanked them. And they said, oh, no problem. So anyway, this is from Japan. You can see the brother. Now look at the difference. This one looks kind of belligerent. Like, don't bother me. Or I'll kick you. <laughs> this one looks a little bit more meek and mild-mannered. This one is like innocent. This one looks like, hey, I'm not the one. <laughs> from ancient Japan. And then this is from, just, we only had a few from Asia because I, published the book, same publishing house in Asia before. I mean, we had a, they published a book on Indonesia. So this time we didn't really do too many. This is from Europe. This is from a place called Crete. Mm -hmm. This is also in the Ashmole Museum at Oxford University. And it shows a shell inlay of a black man from my known Crete, south of, uh, of, of Europe. And this is about 3,700 years old. Crete is significant because it's regarded as the first civilization of Europe. This is from ancient Spain, a place called Osuna in Spain. This is a thousand years before the Moors. So we know the Moors were in Spain. This is a thousand years before the Moors. This is in an archaeological museum in Madrid. And this is Andromeda at Oxford. I showed you that one earlier. Look at this one. This is from a civilization called the Etruscan civilization. And the Etruscans were predecessors of the Romans. And this is in the Etruscan Museum in Rome, Italy. I took this in August. Beautiful piece, isn't it? Here's a little black boy in ancient Rome. This is 2,000 years old. And this is in the Getty Museum in Malibu, California. Oh, man, look at that one. And I tell you, it looks better on my computer than it does up there. I'm looking at it and getting excited. Let me stop that kind of talk. <laughs> <laughs> this is one of the three wise kings who came to pay homage to the Christ child in the manger in Bethlehem. During the European Renaissance, it was common to portray the youngest of the three kings as an Ethiopian. You know the story. They're drawn by the star of the heavens. And they go to Bethlehem to see the Christ child. One of them has frankincense, one of them has gold, and one of them has myrrh. Well, this one is in the Reich Museum in Amsterdam. And can't get any more black than that. And the brother does look sharp. He got a crown on. Wow. These are two I added we, that didn't make the cut, but they were still so good I want to show you. This one is in Berlin, and this one is in Berlin. I've, I've gotten probably a hundred of these now, or at least a lot. <coughs> this one is, is in um, Antwerp in the Netherlands, and this one is called Moses Ethiopian White. This is about 500 years old. They got it half right. <laughs> Here's one in an art museum in Raleigh, North Carolina that I just photographed uh, two or three months ago. This is from Italy, about 500 years old. They're about to behead that guy down there. But look at what's on the shields. Heads of Moors. Mm -hmm. This is Italian. This is about 500 years old. Actually, about 480 years old. Oh, man, look at that. This is a cluster of cameos with a black woman in the center. And we believe this to be the mother of the Duke of Florence, a black man named Alejandro de Medici. 
who was the first black head of state in the modern Western world. He was Duke of Florence in Italy from 1529 to 1537. And that's his mother. A cameo from Europe. This is in the Lubin Pass. I love that. St. Benedict the Moor in the Minneapolis Institute of Art. He's a saint in Italy about 300 years ago, 400 years ago. All these are original pictures wow. from museums around the world. We are in a position to reconstruct our entire history. We can rewrite our history. The information is there. <coughs> I think a lot of us are just not organized, or we don't think we can do it, or it's not important to do it. But it is important to do it. No, who can? When I post something on Facebook, a person will say, they didn't tell us that. They lied to us. <laughs> we were misinformed. And that's true. But whose job, at the end of the day, is it for us to know our history? Our, our, our job. And the Omec heads. I used about eight or nine of them because Dr. Van Sertema was so big on these. This is the smallest of the Olmec heads. This is in Mexico City. This is another big one. This is in a museum called the Anthropology Museum in Jalapa, Mexico. I think this is one. It's called El Rey or the King. There's 17 of these. These are all original. This is the, the best carved of them. You know, when you look, when you're standing there looking at it, you really wonder if it's a replica or if it's the real thing. <laughs> like the one y'all got in front of the film museum, that's a replica. Oh. All the originals are in Mexico. Oh. There's a good replica in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. You got a great replica at the film museum, but these are the originals. <coughs> this one is at a place called Aventa Park in Villamosa. And this one. So I think what these heads represent is a dynasty of African kings in ancient Mexico. They ruled over Mexico for about 300 years. And these heads represent the faces of those rulers. From the side, an Olmec goddess, you see very few women in the Olmec world. And that reinforces the belief to me that the Olmec were a group of African sailors that got shipwrecked. There weren't many of them. But that they were so instrumental in the development of this civilization that they were treated like gods and goddesses, like deities. Some people say that the Olmec civilization was an African civilization. I would strongly, you know, uh, dispute that. The Olmec civilization in the Americas was a Native American civilization in which African people played a tremendous role. The analogy that I use is the United States. You have an African American president, a beautiful, fine, African-American first lady. If I had met her before Barack Obama, I'd be the president and he'd be giving this presentation. <laughs> I love this show. Okay? God knows what those children are going to accomplish. You got an African-American attorney general who's married to a sister. You got, well maybe this is not a good example, a black man on the Supreme Court. No, 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 no. All right? You have to. We know that don't make a I'm not saying any of it makes a difference. I'm just trying to make a point. You got black people prominent in entertainment, Oprah. Yeah. You got athletes like LeBron James, Kobe Bryant, and what have you. Derek Rose. I want to say something about Chicago, right? You got all of that. But that don't mean America is an, and the United States is an African country. It just means that a lot of Africans are here, and some of those Africans rose to very high positions. Right, okay. I'm saying Olmec civilization was like that. It was Native American, but there were some Africans there who turned it out, oh. who probably introduced the ability to move large objects in stone, uh -huh. agricultural science, calendars, writing. The first people to engage in organized sport in the America, right. in the Americas, mm -hmm. Olmec. Oh. And there weren't many women, and that verifies that they were mostly soldiers. All right. This one is called the Kobata head. It's the biggest one. It looks like the brother is asleep, yeah. like a lot of us. <laughs> <laughs> I ain't gonna mention no names or nothing like that. <laughs> now, I'm with a group, but we're running out of time and we don't have any more budget for museums. So I told the group we had just seen this head in a place called Santiago Tuxla is in the public square. 
I said, you guys wait for me. I'll be right back. And I left the group. I'm ashamed, but I left them. And I didn't look back. And I walked about a block and a half, and I went in another museum, and I went in there, and this is what I found. This is the one with the braids in the back. Oh, okay. You can see, I photographed it from all sides. And you can see the braids, which are starting to fade. Here's another one I sent to the publisher and told him, you pick which one stands out the most. And in that same museum is that, which is called El Negro. People who study Europeans who talk about the Omec civilization don't even look, they don't talk about that. So not, you have more than just the massive stone heads, but you have a whole range of artifacts from the Olmec world, look at it, that are so African, it's nicknamed El Negro. Wow. So the Spanish knew it, even if modern Europeans don't want to recognize it. So what do they do? Ignore it. From ancient Mexico, I think it's Olmec, this is in the Natural History Museum in New York City. I'm gonna finish up. And this one is in Boston. And it shows an Olmec being tortured. He's been castrated, a black man in the Olmec world. And maybe the Africans were just eventually defeated, destroyed, wiped out in wars with the Maya or the Aztec. Now this is Mayan, and this is in Belize City. And what you have here are Mayan warriors going to battle black skin. 1,500 years ago. This is another one from ancient Mexico. This is in the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. And the caption says that it's a warrior that petroleum was poured on top of. They said the reason he's black is somebody poured some oil on him. This is from ancient Mexico. It looks like he's straight out of Kemet. This is 1,400 years old. This is in Mexico. And they have a bunch of these in the museum. How do you explain it? This is not taught in the Mexican schools any more than serious African history is taught in U.S. schools. So Mexicans don't know anything about this. And the black people in Mexico just know that they were enslaved, for the most part. From Peru, from Canada, and finally, just a few images that I hope Ivan would like. This is, now these are not originals now, what I'm gonna show you now. This is Ivan Van Sertimer with the great Dr. Chancellor Williams who wrote the book, Destruction of Black Civilization. The book changed my life, it made me want to be a historian. <laughs> and there is Ivan Van Sertema. This is a brother named LeGrand Clegg, who was a deputy city attorney of Compton, California, but was writing about Africans in pre-Columbian America before Dr. Van Sertema. This brother is an ancestor, now his name is Majid Mahdi, and he was uh, killed in a hit-and-run accident. And he's the person that made me want to study Egypt. You know, almost 40 years ago, 30 years ago even. 1980, yeah, more than 30 years ago. And we were the closest of friends. People would call me Majid and him Renoko sometimes. We could finish each other's sentence. That's how tight we were. And he's the brother that made me want to study Egypt. And of course, very young, exceptionally handsome, Renoko Rashidi. <laughs> I even had a little hair at that time. <laughs> and I think that's my last clip on tie. This is a Compton Community College where I worked organizing programs. This is around 1982. And here I am, because um, all these people were influential in the development of the Journal of African Civilization that I was responsible for. I here I am with the great Dr. John Henry Clark. I've had some wonderful teachers, big time. I've been very fortunate. If I were to ever write a book about great men and women that I've known, these guys would be on the top of the list. With John Henry Clark, I liked Dr. Clark and he liked me. And we spent a lot of time together in different parts of the world. And I was introducing him and I guess I felt like I was his bodyguard that night. It just made me feel good to be close to a man of that stature. And I would introduce him, I remember I introduced him, I went to I said, Dr. Clark, what do you want me to say? He said, don't make it too long and don't make it sound like an obituary. <laughs> Get out of the way, in other words, and let me talk. And another great story, who lives in Chicago? Here we are on the south side. And this is a man named John G. Jackson. who wrote Introduction to African Civilizations, Man, God, and Civilization, Ages of Gold and Silver. And I edited some of his work and got to know him a little bit. And I love that photograph. <laughs> and this is one of Ivan's mentors, his major mentor, I suppose, 
I've met Sir Edwin Spencer, his name is Jan Peru. And he's a person from Guyana who introduced Ivan to the book called Africa and the Discovery of America that put Ivan on the path to examining Africans in ancient America. This is a postcard that Ivan sent me from Egypt. Ivan only went to Egypt one time. Ivan was not a big traveler. I'm the big traveler in the family. Ivan would say, Renoko, you can sit in your library and do just as good a work as you could if you were traveling around the world. That was his philosophy. Okay. I don't know what he would say now. So he went to Egypt one time. He says, Renoko, who should I go with? I said, Aza Hillier, because if you go with Dr. Ben, y'all going to be fighting on the, on the back. Of the <laughs> and he sent me this postcard of Akhenaten from Kibbutz. Okay. This is pre Columbian. This is in a museum in Barcelona. I'm before you, anybody sends me any more notes, 10 minutes. I'm done. I see you poised, poised. You look, I'm profiling you, man. <laughs> you look like you're going to send me a note. This is a small piece. Preclon Omec also in the museum in Barcelona. And I, kept, I took this picture and I knew that Ivan didn't have it. I scooped him and I kept saying, I'm going to send Ivan this picture. You're going to love it. And over a period of time, Ivan began to lose his memory. I guess it was Alzheimer's. And I kept saying I was going to send it, send it, send it. And he died. So Ivan, here's the picture. I know you're looking at it right now. Now. Let me finish off by showing you, we've gone beyond the book. Let me just show you some of the pictures that I've been able to take on recent travels. Now, this to me is a remarkable story. I took a group to Cameroon. I took a group to Turkey in the end of December, I mean, end of November, beginning of December. And then, since my daughter lives outside of Paris and she's, I adore her, and can't ever spend enough time with her. And she's always saying, Daddy, I miss you. Where are you? She called me today. Uh, remarkable little child. Um, I, I went to see her. I decided to spend the last six weeks in France with my, my, my child. She wanted me to be there for what she called Noel, Christmas. It doesn't mean anything to me, but it's a nice time to be with family. And it's my favorite time of year. So on the way to France, from Istanbul, where I had to fly through, I stopped in Athens. I've been in Greece three times before. The first time I went, Egypt, the uh, archaeology museum was closed. They were refurbishing it for the Olympic Games. And the second time I went, the Egyptian section and the Bronze Age section was closed, the heart of the museum. So I did research, I checked on the website, and it said everything was open, come on, here are the hours, and I went. And one Sunday morning, I was only there for two nights, I went to the museum, the museum was open. Old building. And I walked through there, and the Egyptian section was closed. I was so disappointed. I figured the Greeks must have a lot of stuff. But I expressed my disappointment out loud. I didn't really get mad, but I let them know, look, I, could I flew all the way from New York, which was a lie, but they didn't know it. <laughs> I said, how could you do that? It says on the website, it's open. Right. I'm a visiting professor. I flew a long way. So this white woman says, sir, I'm really sorry. There's nothing we can do. We don't have enough staff to staff the entire building. Only during the height of the tourist season is everything open. I said, that's really, really messed up. And she says, wait a minute. So she said, have a seat. You know, so she went and made a phone call. She says, no promises, just wait here. And sure enough, about 15 minutes later, a white man, naturally, with a big ring of keys says, come with me. He opened up the doors to the Egyptian section of the museum wow. and only let me and he wouldn't let anybody else in there. And closed the door. I was kind of scared. Closed the door. <laughs> <laughs> Behind me, turning all the lights. Okay. So you have a camera? And let me wander at leisure through the Egyptian to the Egyptian section of the National Museum of Greece. Wow. This is not just a little museum on the corner. Oh. This is the national museum of the country. Now, what's that about? The ancestors the ancestor, said, look here. It was remarkable. I thought something was wrong. I, was, I, I wanted to get out of the museum real quick. All right. These are from Greece. Look. Fair skin. You know what? It's deep in our community. So back then, Africa was a cultural influence. Even if you weren't African, it was Africa that set the, the standards and the stop. Look at that curly hair on this Greek stat, and the nose is missing to me. 
and even more ancient. You see, I like those. You can see how soft how the size of them. And here's one of a purely white woman. This is Pallas Athena, the Greek patron goddess of Athens. But you can see the nose is missing too. When I began to see these in the Greco-Roman world, I knew they were purely white people. Mm -hmm. I began to realize that there was more to those noses being knocked off in Egypt than just racial animus. Oh. Because that's what a lot of us believe. That some mean, nasty white people went to Africa and out of spite because they looked so African, they knocked the noses off. I used to believe it. I don't believe that anymore. I think that this is a ritual associated with death in the Mediterranean world. I've seen many, many European statues with the same thing. Now, I'm not here to defend European behavior. I'm the last one to do that. <clears throat> but if we're serious about scholarship, it can't always be how we feel and what I heard exactly. and what somebody said and they told me and on YouTube, we need to do a little research. Our ancestors who were taken through the door of no return deserve a more serious effort. Chancellor Williams, who I talked about a moment ago, said the African historian must be on a relentless search for truth and must not tremble with fear when that truth is contrary to what we would prefer to believe. African people have done so many remarkable things that we don't have to fabricate. We don't have to make history up. It can stand on its own merit. African history, African people are the greatest people in history. We've done more than anybody else. We have the greatest story that's barely been told. And all we have to do is tell the story. These are very, very, very ancient people. Hot and humid. You can see my glasses are all fogged up. And you can get a sense as to the size of these people. And I'm five. Look at Okay. These people are like up here. Really? Wow. Yeah. You can see the elder there. Oh, yeah. That's true. Sailing down the river, because I know y'all wouldn't believe me. Otherwise, I know people are cynical and skeptical. <laughs> And finally, I think there may be one more. This might be the last one. This is just an example of the art that I found at a palace. I found many, many things that made me feel like the people of um, Cameroon, especially the Mamaleke, were originally from the Nile Valley. Mm. And you see expressions of it in the art. The Nile Valley was a great population center of ancient Africa. And as the invasions began to occur, Africans began to migrate to other parts of Africa, southern Africa, West Africa, etc. No, this is the last one. And this is a, me in the um, Jalapa Museum, the Anthropology Museum in Jalapa, Mexico. Now, I took a group there last summer. What I try to do before I take a group is to go do what's called a FAM trip, where you go and investigate, you make sure the hotels are cool, that everything is doable, you go to the restaurants, you meet the people on the tour companies and all of that. But this time, I wasn't able to do it. So we're kind of on our own. And I'm leading the group of like 20-some Africans from the United States and Africa on this tour. We wanted to go see the old Olmecas, at least I do. I developed the itinerary. But I had not been there. And we got lost on the way, coming from Mexico City. And there was a big traffic jam. And then you always wonder if the museum will be open. Will the artifacts that you want to see be there? never know and your reputation is on the line. This is not just you, you're responsible for all these people who are hoping you know what you're doing. Yeah. They spend all this money and then you find the museum and then you go and the museum is open and the first thing you see when you walk in the museum is that. Wow. An actual Olmec head and you feel redemption. <laughs> <laughs> I told y'all, <laughs> there it is, what a look of sadness, what a feeling of satisfaction. <laughs> so that smirky look on Renoko Rashid's face, mission accomplished, y'all can go home now if you want to, I'm the one who's going to talk trash, I pulled it out. It's a wonderful feeling when you go to these places. There's the museum. There's the peak. Sometimes things you've never seen before, even in a book. Mm -hmm. You meet other black people. It's as though you feel 
like, yes, we were taken through the door of no return. Yes, they thought it was the end of us. Yes, they told us we didn't have a history, and there you are, in front of Africans who came to the Americas thousands of years ago. What greater sense of satisfaction could you have? You know, when I do these things, I feel like I'm making history. Not only a historian, but you're making history. It's a wonderful feeling. And so when I'm talking to young people, I tell them, find something you can do in your life that you can be passionate about, or you can feel good about, or you can feel like you're making the world a better place, uplifting your community, giving knowledge of self. So that's what I do. And I'm fortunate that the people at Culture Connections think enough of me to invite me here from time to time to share this information with you. I do this all over the world. I do it all over the United States. And right now, it's Black History Month. So it's really what I'm doing day in and day out. It's wonderful. It's tough sometimes. You get frustrated. You get angry. Sometimes you even question yourself. But more often than not, you thank the ancestors for giving you a mission in life and blessing you to be able to fulfill that mission. Hotel, you all. God bless. Thank you. Give Culture Connections a big round of applause.